Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. I hope you had a, a good break. Uh, I really just want to take a moment to gather a round of applause for all the organizers for uh, this awesome conference they've put it. So please give it for the organizers. Thank you. Uh, I'm here today to talk about OM Next. It might not be a very familiar concept for you, uh, but I'm glad that others before me did a very great job at introducing the concept that I'm going to talk about. Um, so this talk in particular is about the way that clients and different platforms for that we program for today and the way they are changing the way that we develop these applications. Uh, I'm uh, currently a student in Germany. Uh, I'm originally from uh, Portugal. Uh, and I've been a contributing for ClojureScript and uh, Ohm for the past year or so. Um, so I want to start by a time where we, where we, uh, when we were building uh, REST applications. And what we would expect normally from REST is that we define our logical and logically separated resources, uh, each one identified by their own URI, uh, have our clients, uh, our little happy, nice clients request these URIs and get the data that the endpoint decides that they're going to get. Uh, and this is actually the, the, the reality is that for each endpoint, you can really only uh, request or create the, the trivial data. Uh, once you, you go and you need more than the set of data that that endpoint uh, gives you, uh, you, you, you need to, to make a decision. Uh, you either bloat your endpoint by uh, giving, uh, putting more data there that doesn't really belong to that resource. And what this means is that uh, other clients that might not need uh, that data will be overfetching. Uh, or you, you choose to make multiple requests. And um, multiple requests are really not acceptable for uh, today's low-end devices or for 3G connections. Um, so this is a problem, and we, we, we want to get out of it. Uh, the thing is that this was not unknown at all. And at the time of REST formulation, uh, Dr. Roy Fielding actually uh, uh, acknowledged that the, the problem with the, the, the uniform interface is that data is tr really transferred in a standardized form, and it doesn't fit what every application, uh, every specific application needs. Uh, so once again, the problem is really about the, uh, the wide variety of clients that we have today and that we develop for. Uh, and uh, changing the endpoint is just a huge problem because of the, the way that it will affect uh, the, the other clients that are also uh, hitting the, that endpoint. Uh, and so we really need a, a way out of this, uh, this current situation. Uh, and over the years, a number of technologies have, came out, have come out to uh, try and solve the, 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 this very problem. Um, with, uh, so they, they, they said, that I don't want to interact with REST APIs. Um, they're, they just lead to, to huge sources of complexity. So uh, this led to the, the popularity of document-oriented source uh, and things like uh, Meteor, uh, Parse, Couchbase. Firebase, uh, and so, but for me, these, these technologies, they, they really don't uh, solve the, the problem. They're, they're very nice technologies, and I'm not saying uh, otherwise, but they, they really just solve the symptom. Uh, because by, by making it easy to, to, to sync and send trees of data to, to, to a certain server, um, we, we lose the, the benefit of relational queries, and we, can, uh, we cannot run uh, any sophisticated uh, queries against our backend anymore. Uh, and so we, we really need to, to define a goal that, that lets us overcome uh, the problems that, that REST uh, means for, for these new types of applications. Uh, and there is one more thing, is that in a REST system, everything is out of band. Um, the actual code implementation is separate from the, uh, the, the specification of these endpoints. Uh, and w if you need to hit an endpoint, you, don't, you have no idea what it, it's going to return you. So you really need to, to, to go check some documentation that may or may not be outdated to, 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 to inform yourselves about what is going to return. So what we really want is to, to shift the control to, to our clients. Uh, and I'm going to introduce a bit of jargon here from what I and others before me called the demand-driven the demand architecture. 
And this is demand-driven as opposed to supply-driven in, in, that, in, that, in the REST sense that you get what the server dictates that you get. In this case, the clients decide what you're going to get. And so the first thing about demand-driven is that, that you need to have a demand. You need to uh, exactly specify the total of your data requirements and the shape that you want to get that data in. Right? You, don't need, you don't want to be aggregating or transformating data. You just want to, to get the data and pass it immediately to, to your render function to, to display the data on, on your UI. Uh, and so uh, you want to describe this because the, the service, the, the backend implementation, cannot predict what a client needs when you're hitting a certain endpoint. So we'll have uh, our backend be more dynamic and have our clients describe exactly what they're looking for. Um, so the second property that we need is composition, in, in that we're all uh, building UIs uh, by, uh, by using components. And this has been touched upon today a lot. Uh, and so we want, through composition, uh, for example, by a recursive data structure, we want to have each component say what uh, data it needs. And we want this um, piece of demand to be valid by itself but also want to compose it through a recursive data structure uh, so that we can send the whole thing that an application needs in one batch to request to our servers. Um, and so the next thing that we want is a way to interpret the query language or this recursive data specification that we define. Um, and so uh, th this is what makes it really storage agnostic in that you don't need to be tied to the, the details of uh, a backend implementation or a backend uh, data storage uh, uh, with a, a language uh, that you, you, well, tied, as I said. Uh, and so in this sense, and this is a quote about GraphQL, uh, is, is a query language, really. But just like the URLs are the query language of REST, so it, it's just a contract to define uh, how to tell the API server what you're looking for, but not how to get it. Um, and so I, I just, uh, I'll have a first demo here. And I'll, I'll need to mirror displays because I don't, I don't have the skill of programming over my shoulder. Uh, and can you all see this? Yeah, right. And so it, here on the left, um, I have a little bit, uh, a little uh, data structure that describes uh, what kind of uh, properties and at or attributes uh, I want from the, the piece of data that is displayed on the right side. And, and so let's say for a moment that I'm developing for, for a, a, a mobile phone. Um, and uh, having all these properties right here uh, is too much, and I, I cannot present them uh, in my client. Uh, and so I can always fetch them in the REST sense and throw them out, but this means that there is data go going over the wire that I don't need. So let's uh, make this efficient, or at least a bit more efficient. And so I can specify for uh, a certain speaker, uh, a certain talk, that I really can only present its title. And I run, it, I run the query against my, my backend, and boom, I just, I just get the attributes that I exactly asked for. What's more is that I didn't need to ask person A or person B in the, in the backend team to put or, uh, uh, or remove those attributes for me uh, in the implementation. And there's one more thing, is that, as you can see, um, a speaker's talk is a logically uh, different entity in my database. And, and so through this query language, I can uh, query uh, several, uh, across several entities uh, uh, through in one query and get everything that I asked for. OK. So oh, next has been influenced by uh, a lot of things that came out in recent years. And React was, uh, for me, one of the best things to, to happen to UIs in that it just brings functional programming to the, uh, to, to the browser in a way that, OK, so let's always render from root. And uh, I don't care about uh, the, the, the 
huge uh, source of complexity that is, that is uh, dealing with the DOM, the DOM implementation. So let's just say uh, declaratively specify what I want to render and just render it. Uh, and so an another thing that influenced the design of Omnext is really in, in GraphQL, uh, which you might or might not be familiar about uh, with. Uh, and so Relay is a, a thing, a library by Facebook that lets you uh, annotate your UI components with queries, uh, with the attributes that, that you want to receive. And GraphQL is the, the, the backend part uh, for that. Uh, and so they play very ni nicely together. Uh, however, uh, doing a uh, GraphQL implementation uh, is not trivial, I think. Uh, Facebook didn't open source that part. They only re really released the spec. Um, and so, but the, but the thing about this is that moving towards these new kinds of systems allowed uh, Facebook and others to delete a ton of code from their, res uh, from their RESTful implementations. Uh, this is a quote from Lee that was talking here uh, this morning. Hi. Uh, and so by Netflix, uh, Falcor um, is uh, the same thing, but derived from, from Netflix's uh, microservices architecture. In, and uh, uh, the previous speaker was speaking about Falcor in a way that it lets you bind to the cloud and seem like uh, all your data is local to you. And this is an awesome concept. Uh, another thing is that uh, Falcor has th this concept of a router, which knows how to route uh, each key that the UI needs to their specific uh, microservice that knows how to serve that key. Um, and so also Netflix, they, they ended up eliminating 90% of their uh, uh, networking code when moving for, from REST to uh, Falcor. Um, but my, my favorite stack uh, is uh, the Clojure one. Uh, I, re I really fell in love with Clojure. Uh, some years ago, and if you don't know what it is, uh, Clojure is a dynamic uh, programming language, uh, a Lisp for the JVM, and it has spawned the, uh, the implementation of Clojure Script, which is a, uh, a set of Clojure that compiles to JavaScript. So you can use the, the same language that you use on your server, you can use it on the clients, just like you might be using with JavaScript in Node. Um, and so Transit is a, a, a format on top of uh, JSON that, uh, that piggybacks on JSON and Webpack that lets you uh, transfer these uh, closure and closure scripts data structures which are immutable by default over the wire. Uh, and Datomic, which is right there at the bottom right, uh, is a, an implementation that uh, is derived from the same concepts and features uh, a sense of immutability and, and really a sense of time uh, built uh, directly into the database. So this to, to introduce that OM next. Um, is uh, the, the uh, closure script and closure library uh, that uh, intends to deal with the, these problems that we have today. Uh, and so Omnex was originally bu uh, built by, by David Nolan, who is the uh, core, uh, the lead contributor to, uh, to closure script. And uh, Omnex is like the, the second uh, iteration of his design process. Uh, so he first developed uh, ohm.core, uh, which was the first one. And, uh, and after seeing the ideas behind Falcor and Relay, uh, he really rethought his uh, uh, process and, and came up with uh, Omnext. Uh, and so Omnext, Omnext lets us have two really beneficial properties that we, that are, as I said before, that clients can really, um, they can really request the exact total response that they need to hydrate their UIs. And they can communicate novelty atomically to, to to the backend without sacrificing the power of relational queries. And so Omnext is really opinionated uh, in that, uh, and you might be familiar with the, the single source of truth of opinion, it's uh, what uh, Redux also uh, enforces, I believe. Uh, and so another opinion is that we minimize flushing to the DOM, and we minimize flushing to the DOM by using React uh, as the underlying uh, 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 UI implementation, uh, and so we also want to to abstract from the the, the library user um, both asynchrony and the event model. So asynchrony is just uh, a problem because it, uh, of uh, the the callback hell and cascades that fortunately are going to be solved in the next uh, version of uh, ECMAScript, 
as we heard uh, today. And event models, event models are, are just really another source of complexity because of uh, uh, event cascading. And so in Omnex, we have a way to abstract all of these from the developer. And so this is a checkpoint, and I'm going uh, to go through all of these uh, questions um, in, uh, in the next slides. So brace yourselves. How do we make precise requests with Omnext? We have, just like in Relay, we have query expressions. And query expressions are co-located with components, and they let, let us annotate uh, uh, exactly within the definition of a component what the, this exact component needs to hide, to hide the, 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 their data needs uh, for, for rendering. And so this is how a, uh, a Omnex component looks like. Uh, if you don't like the parentheses, just ignore them. Um, this is almost like a, a React component. You can add the other lifecycle methods as well, and everything works. Uh, these query expressions, um, they are what lets us um, specify what our client implementation needs. And we have, for example, a, a single keyword uh, that uh, uh, expresses an attribute, uh, a parameterized uh, keyword. Uh, this is how to perform a join, and this is what I showed you earlier when uh, showing you the, uh, the little uh, demo there. Uh, and so in this case, we're uh, asking for a person's address, but we are really only concerned with uh, the, the, the street and the zip code. Uh, the entity might have uh, other properties in, uh, in the backend, which, but the, the particular client that uh, writes this query expression is just not concerned with it. Um, and so we, we also have a way to express mutations. Mutations are something that change the state of our application. And so mutations are, um, they are expressed as regular function calls, and uh, our parser, uh, which is another thing in Omnext, knows how to interpret them. And so the parser is really what takes a, a pure function from query to, to data. It's what hydrates the, the, the query expression that we pass onto it. Uh, and so this is the same concept as Falcor, uh, in, just in the way that uh, Falcor calls this routing, and in Omnex we call this uh, parser, uh, or parsing. And so the parser runs reads and mutations, and it runs both on the front end and the back end. And this is uh, the, the actual uh, the, the interpretation layer that I described earlier. Um, and it sits at the edge of our system. Uh, you never call the parser directly. Uh, and it's actually what allows us to abstract a synchrony from the developer. Because everything in Omnex looks very synchronous, although it might not run synchronously. Um, and so this is what uh, address our uh, queries that we pass to it uh, without reshaping. We just get the, 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 the data out of the parser in the, the way that we, the, the shape that we expect it to, to be passed to our render function so that it can render immediately without performing any additional transformations. Um, so how do we communicate novelty uh, with our backends? Uh, and the answer is the same. We run query expressions through the parser. And because query expressions are data structures, we can manipulate these data structures and say which attributes can be satisfied locally, and which ones need to be sent to the server. And so whenever we cannot satisfy, we don't have any, uh, a thing in our local app state that satisfies what we, we are currently asking for, we can just send the query to the server, which also runs the parser implementation to hydrate that data and pass it back onto to, to our UI. Um, and so uh, there, there is a key after a mutation that I'm running. And what that says is, after you run that mutation, um, reread this key. And this is what allows us not to have an event model. Because we have qu query expressions specifying keys to be reread after the mutation. Uh, just Omnex is just smart enough to know which qu components depend on this specific key. And so it knows which components it has to update. Um, so creating information. Um, and this is the part about communicating novelty atomically to the server, is uh, th this has just an awesome synchronization story in Omnext in a way that you can create temporary information on the client, uh, non-trivial information. You can create relationships between this data, 
and you can send it to, to the backend, and the backend can reply with the mappings from your temporary IDs that you had on the, the client to the real IDs that are now persisted on the, on the backend. And you never need to delete uh, uh, this temporary information that you created on the client. You just need to replace these IDs, and Omnex does it all automatically for you. Um, so what about uh, local state? Uh, Omnext has first-class support for client-only state. Um, and so we just support a, a merged view of uh, remote uh, state with local state. Uh, and so because the parser is able to, to pick uh, which things are local which, and which are remote, we, uh, we can, this just works. Um, so there's only one problem, which is that we commonly we model our domains as graphs with interconnected relationships between our entities, but we need to render trees. So we need some kind of normalization. Uh, and because we have query ex expressions in Omnext, uh, Omnext can automatically normalize and denormalize your data into a format uh, that there are no uh, repeated data in your, in your state. And I'll show you an example just uh, afterwards. Uh, and so normalization is a concept is, uh, there that is also in Relay and Falcor. But uh, Omnex has th th this uh, uh, added advantage that you can normalize and denormalize it for you. And so let's look at a, um, a very simple data set of um, a few people, and uh, let's say I from those people I have uh, favorites. Um, and so you can see in this data set that Bob there is repeated twice. Uh, and so a normalization pass into this in this data um, will have to replace uh, this uh, dupl duplicated data with something that uh, relates to, to, the, to what their identity is. And this is something that we, uh, additional that we need to specify in our own components. It's their identity. In this case, after normalization pass, uh, we substitute Alice by a, uh, we call it a, a, a link that uh, knows how to, to find that data in our state. So uh, in this case, Alice is person by name Alice. And if we look into our state and go into the, the person by name dictionary and the key Alice, we find exactly that data that we're uh, looking for. Uh, after the second normalization pass, we have Bob uh, there. Uh, and you, you notice that it only really appears once, and, but there are two links to it. Uh, and so because different um, areas in your screens might show different things, uh, uh, might different attributes at a certain point, when performing this normalization, we merge all the attributes that are found at the identity at that node. Um, and so um, one thing that is different from React, however, in Omnext, is that normally when you perform a transaction, say a set state or uh, something else uh, in React, um, and so see the, the arrow where I say, so there's, this is a, a tree of components, and I'm saying that uh, the component at, at, the, the, at that, that point is a component that performs the transaction. React will always render from root uh, in the sense that it doesn't really re-render from root, but it performs the, the diffing from, from the, the root of your uh, component tree. But in Omnext, because we have query expressions and we know how to relate query expressions to the components that depend on them, uh, we can just really re-render from the place that performed the transaction. And if other subtrees have the, the same identity, we also uh, re-render those subtrees. So uh, we can perform this kind of incremental rendering where we don't even need to re-render re from root. Uh, and so what implications does this have for testing? Um, and so for testing, uh, having a single source of truth and a, a parser that lets us abstract the synchrony and that really doesn't need to interact with our components at all and sits at the edges of the system is just awesome. This, uh, combined with uh, closure scripts immutability, uh, is awesome for, for testing because, because we know that our components, they're just pure functions from the data that we pass them 
uh, onto the, UI, uh, the, the rendered uh, UI, be it DOM or native. Um, so we can just test the UI data tree. And so I'm a really big fan of property-based testing. Uh, for those of you who don't know what property-based testing is, uh, it's uh, opposed to what example-based testing is that, uh, that we commonly do in our uh, systems, in which we specify inputs and output pairs. Uh, in property-based testing, we write invariants. And we have our uh, li uh, generative testing library generate test cases that attempt to falsify these invariants. Uh, but what we, get, what we get for free uh, is shrinking, in that a failing case, the, our library can uh, shrink it to the smallest possible case that uh, fails, so that we can test that case again in an example-based test, for example, and fix the bug. Uh, and so Omnex plays really well with a closure uh, library called test.check, which is uh, the implementation of QuickCheck, uh, originally for Haskell, uh, in, but in closure. Um, and, so, and so in Omnex, because our queries and our mutations, they're data, and we know how to generate data with uh, uh, generative uh, testing generators, uh, we can generate transactions that run against our parser uh, and check the invariance in the resulting state. And I'm going to show you a little uh, demo of that. Uh, so, okay. So here we have a poor man's uh, conference list application. Um, and in this case, uh, I have a list of speakers. You might have seen this data set before. And I'm, I'm selecting the, the speakers that, I, that, that I, I really want to see in the conference. And so I, I, when, I, when I favorite a talk, uh, I'm supposed to get the, the, this talk in the favorites list. Uh, and, but we can see that when I favorite this talk, it, it didn't appear in the favorites list. So I wrote a bug. Um, and so, to not, not, not to do that again, I'm going to uh, property-based test my application uh, in a way that I can be confident that it works. Uh, and so, I can see here, for example, let, wait, is it too small? Yeah. All good? OK, so let's say I want to generate 10 transactions that I will test. And these are based on my, my generators. I'm, I'm going to generate uh, uh, 10 transactions uh, randomly that will run and attempt to falsify my invariant. And so my invariant is that whenever I click on uh, add uh, on favorite a talk, it must appear on both lists. And, and so uh, when I run this command, um, it will uh, check 10 times that when clicking, it really adds to the favorites. And so the result of this is that, and you saw that it's not working, so I really got a false. But the really interesting part here, and you cannot see that, is that it shows me the smallest possible case that I can use to, uh, to, to fix my, uh, the, the smallest possible failing case that I can use to try and fix the bug. Uh, and so because uh, I'm very smart and I, I pre prepared the presentation beforehand, uh, I really already have a, here a fix to the bug. Uh, and so I'm just going to fix the bug on the fly. Uh, wait for the uh, hot load to kick in. And hopefully, when I run this again, I will get that it passed. Um, so if I come back to my, my little poor application and I click favorite, I can see that the, the person appears in the favorites list. But notice that I, I could be confident about this fact without even ever trying the application. And this is just awesome. And so, 
by, by generating random transactions that run against the, uh, the parser and shrinking those failures and getting the, the minimal failure to reproduce the bugs, we can just be very confident about our testing story. So, but by, by, this is actually modeling the user, and by modeling every possible user interaction against our UI, we can just profit. So there's a lot of more things that Omnex supports that I really don't have time to talk about here. Uh, uh, but uh, so, so I'll mention uh, them here briefly. So we, we have, uh, in the query syntax, we have native uh, support for recursive UIs, for heterogeneous UIs, and these are think, uh, Facebook newsfeed, when, uh, uh, which is a really a heterogeneous thing that you don't know what's going to come after, if, if it's a post or a, uh, uh, a photo or a video, right? Um, and because we know how to uh, pick queries from locally from the remote queries, and uh, we, we know which attributes uh, belong to uh, the local uh, cache and the, uh, the, the ones that need to, to be fetched uh, remotely, uh, we can just uh, take this uh, query that is going to be uh, remote, hash it, and get a stable URL that we can send to, to our uh, backend, which is cacheable by default by HTTP standards. So there's no need for any custom caching uh, story. Um, also, Omnext allows you to, is really storage agnostic in the client. Uh, we'll see about the server in a second. But you can really provide a custom storage if you want to use a, 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 a browser local storage or the index the DB. Everything is supported. Um, it also has built-in support for streaming, in, uh, and those are cases where you might want to sideload data uh, without uh, passing through the, 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 the re-render cycle, uh, and server-side rendering, either through running it through uh, uh, React on Node or uh, by uh, some other library that um, I developed that the server-side rendering on the JVM. Um, and so, closure on the server, how does it look like? Uh, of course, if you're using Clojure, it is preferred, and you need to write less boilerplate. But anyhow, if you want to use uh, with uh, other languages, you, you kind of need to implement the, the, the parser logic uh, to parse the, these queries into uh, something that uh, hydrates the, the queries with data. It's uh, definitely easier for languages with the uh, transit format implementation for you to exchange this data between the client and the, the server because the queries are exchanging transit over the wire. Um, and regarding storage, Datomic is supported by default because the, the Omnex query syntax is a superset of Datomic's uh, what they call pull syntax. But other databases work as well. Uh, the, 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 the work the necessary to do there is to uh, uh, translate between this uh, recursive data structure that represents the, the, the demands of our UI to, to um, the underlying uh, storage uh, implementation that you have on your backend. Um, so, Omnex has been in alpha for a long time, almost since uh, November, I think. Um, but it's really reaching beta very fast. Uh, and if it's not next week, it will be the week after that. Uh, the only real thing uh, left to do is write tons of documentation. Uh, because uh, th these concepts are not simple to grasp, and people really need a lot of help. And if you want to help us uh, write documentation, get in touch. Uh, it's always uh, appreciated. Um, but if you don't know where to start, start by these uh, places. Um, first, the, the, the first link there is the um, OM official wiki. Uh, Tony K uh, is a, an American guy that. Uh, provided a, a very nice home tutorial uh, that you can find on uh, his webpage there. And shameless plug, I've written uh, a few blog posts on very specific pain points uh, that you might run into when you're starting out with Ohm Next. Um, so we've seen that we can radically simplify the way that we do UI programming today and data fetching and data creation in our applications. And my my advice to you all is that even if you don't end up using Omnext, 
uh, and really regardless of the library or framework that you end up choosing, just strive for these simple systems with the two properties that I mentioned here. Um, you'll find uh, the slides and the, the, the code demo for this presentation in uh, that repository there uh, in a short moment. And I'll take any questions now if you have them. A lot of talks have been about um, query APIs, but all mostly about reading. Uh, what about writing, and how does Omnext differ from anything else? Right. Um, so uh, you might have uh, seen that I had, uh, I described that Omnext also does mutations. And mutations are something that uh, changes the state of our application, either locally or remotely. Uh, so because mutations also run against the parser, you can also send them remotely if they cannot be satisfied locally. And you can even satisfy them locally and remote, remotely, and this is an optimistic update. Um, so uh, by, by running a mutation remotely, uh, you send as arguments. It's just like a regular function call, but you, you send as arguments the, the, the novelty that you want to persist on the, uh, on, on, on the backend implementation. So that's how you do it. Excellent, thank you. Um, <coughs> excuse me, you've mentioned how old it is. The question was how old is Omnext? And how many people use it and is it production ready? I know you said it's nearly beta. Yeah, so I actually forgot to mention that. Um, there are um, a few companies already using Omnext in production. Uh, it, uh, there's even a framework on top of Omnext called Entangled. Uh, which uh, really uh, builds upon it and uh, adds a lot of uh, nice features that you, you might, n because Omnex is really just building blocks for, for you to, to make this uh, the, the, an a demand-driven implementation. You can run it uh, alone or through another. Uh, uh, how old what is, the, is Omnex was the other question. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Falcor and Relay, they were announced, I think, in January or February last year. And uh, David Nolan uh, saw the, the, the announcement, and uh, I think he started working on it on middle, mid-July, or, well, mid-summer uh, last year. And so it's coming up on a year, uh, or more than a year now. And it's, yeah, that's it. Excellent. A questioner also added to say, impressive testability, by the way. Right, thanks. <laughs> what about browsers that don't have JavaScript for any reason? Browsers that don't have JavaScript. So if you're um, developing for a browser that doesn't have JavaScript, I assume you're, you want to, to develop a static uh, uh, page of some sort. And as I mentioned, uh, there is server-side rendering for OMNESC applications. So as part of your build process, you, can, you could always hook up uh, server-side rendering and deploy that to some CDN and have your uh, applications uh, run through that. Excellent. Thank you very much. Please give it up, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.